Hi, I'm Ryan and thanks for tuning into Market Lab. Today's video is going to be focused on corporate reporting. Now, we've all heard things like company X beat estimates for the quarter or company Y missed on earnings. But what exactly are they talking about? Well, in this two-part series, we're going to be walking you through the mechanics of what corporate reporting is. In the first video, we're going to be walking through what gets released to investors and how to analyze it. And in the second video, we're going to be going through how to tell if a company beat or missed. So let's get into it. The first thing to understand is that companies report data relating to their financial performance over the course of their fiscal year and in between at their respective fiscal quarters. What is a fiscal year? Well, most organizations, for-profit businesses or not, have a fiscal year, also known as a financial year or a budgetary year. This is the 12-month period that sets the accounting cycle so that one year can be compared to another. As it relates to for-profit businesses, this is regulated by the government for things like calculating taxes and also to make sure that nothing fishy is taking place, like accounting fraud. As it pertains to publicly traded companies in the US, they have to provide the earnings report within 60 days of their fiscal year end and within 35 days of their quarter end. Oftentimes, companies will have a fiscal year that aligns with the calendar year, but this isn't always the case. According to the Financial Times, 65% of American companies have fiscal year ends that match the calendar year, but a lot of notable ones don't, like Apple, which ends their year in September, or Microsoft, which ends their year in June. So why would a company do this? Well, there are lots of reasons, the most common of which is seasonality. Companies typically want to end their fiscal year after their strongest quarter. For example, a company that sells mostly back to school supplies might want to end their year on September 30th. It's nice to end on a high note, but as it's the most important reporting period for investors, there's extra incentive to attach it to the quarter with the greatest amount of coverage and data disclosure. Other reasons include matching the fiscal schedule of key customers. For example, the US government's fiscal year end is September 30th, so a company that does a lot of selling to them will often match their fiscal year to theirs to make their bookkeeping a bit simpler. I've even heard of more cost-conscious companies moving their fiscal year end away from the standard calendar year to get away from paying accountants during the busy time when auditing fees are the highest. There are plenty of other reasons that we won't get into right now, but the point is that companies' fiscal year ends can be whenever they want it to be and not necessarily match up with the calendar year. What's the big deal? So assume we're talking about a company with a traditional fiscal year end of December 31st. The company will report four times during the course of the year releasing select financial data, as well as providing qualitative information and answering questions from research analysts. This is very important because, generally speaking, investors don't have that much information to go on in between release dates to gauge how the company is performing. For these reasons, reporting dates and the days immediately following them are when we often see the greatest trading volume in a company's shares, as they are when the investment theses are most likely to be changed. So we've talked enough about how important reporting is, but what exactly is being released that is so important? Let's use Pfizer's fiscal year end 2020 as an example. The most important document here is the 10K. If this were a quarter end though, the document we'd be talking about would be a 10Q, which contains roughly the same data for our purposes, just in a little less depth. The 10K provides a huge amount of information on the company's current financial state, as well as a lot of useful information to help learn about the company's operations. That's why, whether the company has just reported or not, it's generally a good starting point for investors to check out the company's latest 10K. Within the 10K, there are primarily four sections which are very useful to investors. The business overview, risk factors, management discussion and analysis, and the financial statements and their corresponding notes. The business overview provides a useful background on the business, its primary business segments, its locations, competitors, main customers, intellectual property, etc. Basically anything that the company thinks is useful. The caveat here is that while a company can't openly be deceptive, they do have an incentive to overstate opportunities and successes and downplay weaknesses or mistakes. So take whatever they say here with a grain of salt and believe only what you can objectively verify. Next up is risk factors. This is where the company breaks down a fairly comprehensive list of potential risks to their business. In the case of Pfizer, they talk about competitor product launches, risk to insurance reimbursement, portfolio concentration, R&D execution, etc. Next up is the management discussion and analysis, usually just called the MDNA. And it's where the company can walk qualitatively through all the little nuances of the quarter that may not be clear just by looking at the financials. For example, in Pfizer's MDNA, they walk through the specific impacts the COVID pandemic has had on their business and the impact that specific drugs going off patent has had on their profitability. This section is great for learning about the big, important situations that a company is currently facing. And once you've covered a company long enough, you really notice the little changes in tone and phrasing which can impact your thesis. The financial statements and notes contain the company's four main financial statements, the income statement, balance sheet, cash flow statement, and statement of shareholder equity, as well as the notes to the financial statements. 
The notes are subsections that walk through specific information from the statements that require just a little bit more clarity. For example, Pfizer notes have sections that show all the different bond maturities, all the stock options outstanding, the different type of fixed and intangible assets that the company has, and the pension and post-retirement benefit liability breakdown. Also, for those not familiar with finding this information on a company, the simplest way is to just Google the company name followed by investor relations. Within the investor relations section, 10Ks and 10Qs are generally under a quarterly reporting section or occasionally under a government or SEC filing section. In the case of Pfizer, it's conveniently under both. Next up is the annual report. A lot of people use the term 10K and annual report interchangeably since they typically contain almost identical information. The key differences are that 10Ks are standardized documents to be submitted to the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, while annual reports are directed to investors and include some feel-good promotion awarding from management and colorful graphs. I would say that it seems that there's a trend to move away from annual reports, so don't be surprised if the company you're looking at doesn't have one and instead just relies on a 10K for that information. For example, I didn't use Pfizer here because what they call their annual report is actually just a straight up 10K. And instead, they use something called an annual review to fill in with some of the fluffy colorful bits that you'd see in an annual report. Annual reports are also contained in the investor relations section of a company's website, usually just under a financial section. The next important document is the company's presentation. Here the company can visually draw attention to its successes and highlight things that are important for investors to know. In the case of Pfizer, they do things like focusing attention on key products and their growth, updating investors on important milestones with products, in this case the COVID vaccine, and laying out their financial expectations for the year ahead. So the presentation is useful on its own, but it's typically meant to be used in conjunction with management's quarterly conference call as part of a webcast. On it, management walks through their respective slides adding color. Afterwards, management will open up the call to questions from the research analysts from the different investment banks who cover the stock. This is called the Q&A and is an invaluable resource to investors trying to learn about a company. As I've mentioned before, management teams have an incentive to shy away from being too open about the risks or negatives in their disclosure about the company, but it's harder for them to hide when getting asked point blank by the street. The Q&A will tell you questions that the research analysts, the people who know the stock better than anyone else, have, and what kind of things you need to evaluate in making your investment decisions. A lot of times, I've done due diligence on companies, thinking everything was fine, just to get to the Q&A, only to see management get drilled on some big issues that I hadn't even considered yet. Again, presentations and conference calls are on the company's investor relations site, usually under a section with events in the name. Companies will usually give you the choice of watching the webcast or just to read through the call script. I prefer the latter, in case I miss anything or if I want to control F around to find key points of interest to me. Last but not least is the press release. The presser is the first thing that investors look at after a quarter because it has all the relevant information on how the quarter went front and center. Basically a mini version of a 10K or 10Q, this document contains a lot of qualitative and quantitative information on the company, but one of its greatest value adds is where the company presents its non-GAAP or adjusted financials, which typically aren't displayed anywhere else in such detail. I'll dive into what non-GAAP or adjusted financials are later in greater depth, but suffice it to say that these adjusted numbers remove a lot of one-time gains or losses, as well as some non-cash items, with the idea being to just look at the core recurring parts of a business. A quick example is that here, this company had a nice windfall from selling a subsidiary and also recorded a loss from an investment in a startup that failed. As neither of these items can reasonably be expected to recur, we remove their impact from the earnings calculation. One of the main reasons for doing this is to make comparing fiscal periods more easy in order to better evaluate progress within a business. As you can see here for Pfizer, the non-GAAP figures appear to better reflect the steady progress that took place within the business, where well, the GAAP figures appear all over the place, not really adding much value. So that's the basics of corporate reporting, but be sure to check out our following video where we get into how to tell if a company beat or missed. Thanks for tuning into Market Lab.